All right, so we're firing up the, uh, the PowerPoint here. You know, th this next section is, um, is called uh, Against the Grain, Best Practices from the Front Lines. We're, we're, we will uh, highlight uh, breakthrough strategies and scalable solutions that have helped uh, sports providers and participants, um, help, help the MAD participants lower the dropout rate and protect the safety of children. Um, and uh, let me cue it up here. There we go. And, uh, okay, so uh, just a couple quick uh, PowerPoint slides to help inform the discussion. Uh, you know, Robin Shepard and I were just talking a minute ago about what the barriers to participation are, and maybe I need to add one or two more since you've done all this research on it. But as a journalist going around, I, I have basically decided there are, there are three P's in play um, that, that drive participation. One are places. Kids need sufficient and nearby fields gyms, rinks, uh, and they need to be used efficiently. Are they open all the time? Uh, can, can basketball courts and, and ice rinks uh, be, uh, you know, uh, carved up in a way where, where more than, um, you know, two teams could be playing at one time? Or you can do a bunch of small-sided games, perhaps, where you can get more kids active in a given space. Uh, the second P would be people, simply trained coaches and administrators. Um, we are a nation of, of, of volunteers who, who run our sport uh, system, and it is sometimes hard to recruit those volunteers to, uh, to be part of our teams, and it's, it's especially difficult to tell them to go through a certain amount of uh, training in order to uh, volunteer their time. Uh, programs, programs, whoa. Programs that are uh, developmentally appropriate and that meet the needs of uh, the child. The f oh my goodness, sorry guys first time I've used this. Uh, meet the, the needs of uh, the child, the family, and the community. Um, so let's take a look. Boy. All right. So let, let's take a look at sport participation rates since, since 2000. And this is more uh, Sporting Goods Manufacturing Association uh, data. Uh, we're going to look at the sports that uh, have lost participants. Uh, since then, and now this is every uh, this is uh, ages six and up. So it's it's not just children; it is adults. But team sports are certainly dominated by by kids. Roller hockey, down. Wrestling, down. Softball, skateboarding, BMX bikes, uh, bicycling, tackle football, ice hockey, softball, martial arts, uh, golf, uh, baseball, eight point one percent, beach volleyball. 4.2 percent, and I, I need to make a distinction here. This is not league play. This is not just organized play. This is this is uh, structured and unstructured play. So it includes pickup play as well. Just anybody engaging in these games in some form or another, which will uh, which will differ sometimes from from the the data that the the individual leagues will have because they're just obviously looking at organized play. Um, uh, gymnastics is down. Basketball is down. So the uh, and, and what's what's ironic about this, well, I guess sad about it is, is since 2000, the U.S. population has grown by nine percent. So there, these 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 figures are not adjusted for uh, for population growth. They're they're uh, pure numbers. So what sports are up? Yeah. Well, let's go to that, John. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I work with you all these years. We, we begin to think alike, I guess. Yeah. All right. Here are the sports, John, who have, uh, have, who have bucked the trend. Lacrosse is up 218% since 2000. Snowshoeing. Woohoo! Don't ask me why. That's from a base of five. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, table tennis. Table tennis is interesting. That's a, an active sport. It's fairly cheap. It's uh, it's accessible. You can put put ping pong tables in small spaces. It's an interesting sport to think about. Um, tennis is up 45.7 percent. And Patrick McEnroe is here to uh, talk to us about the growth there and what they've done well. <laughs> uh, cross country skiing, 28 percent. Target shooting, 25 percent. Trail running, 23%. Snowboarding, 19%. Alpine skiing, 11%. Bowling, 7 And trap shooting, 
Uh, you know, you, maybe Tommy could speak, but some sports, including soccer, weren't, they were measured differently in 2000, so they, I think, so they didn't have uh, ten, tenure data. Two points on this. This is, um, this is our data. It's a, it's a very big deal, but you really do have to look at two things. First of all, the big picture is that it measures casual and non, uh, if you did it once or three times or ten times or a hundred times. It's a pretty important difference. We also measure core, which the numbers are a little different. And secondly, it's a moment in time we look at the decade, but the uh, the base for lacrosse and snowshoeing, for example, was really small in 2001. And so you see some of that growth there as well. Uh, but they pretty much reflect fairly where we are. Great. Did you have ar did archery? Did you test archery? Uh, we do test archery. Um, I think that it probably, it just, that's just probably relatively small, so it was whatever it was in the previous decade relative to now. Mm -hmm. Rugby. 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 rugby is absolutely would be in the top in the top five. It's not in there simply because in 2000 it was so small that we didn't include it. But it is it is girls field hockey and rugby are the two two of the fastest growing sports in the last three or four years, both girls and boys. Yeah. So there are some good things happening out there, you know, um, and there are some people who have figured out. Uh, some good practices, and that's really what this all this session is all about, to give you some ideas of, uh, okay, maybe we should do that. And to uh, moderate the session, I'm going to bring in uh, Christine Brennan, who I've known for a long time. She probably doesn't even remember this, but I was uh, 17 years old, working at the Miami Herald doing grunt work, and uh, just hoping to get a byline in the paper, and everybody, all the editors, John Wallen and those guys were so... Rrr. And Christine was like the nicest person on the phone. She would take my copy and was very understanding. So I was 18, I wasn't I? <laughs> You're very because generous. I was about 23, but uh, no, Tom, I remember that well, and thank you. And again, I want to echo uh, what so many have said. Thank you for organizing this, really, uh, to the Aspen Institute and to Tom. This is this is your baby. Congratulations. I mean that. Uh, excellent work. And as an aside, before we charge into this and. And uh, guess who we're going to talk to first, the leader in the clubhouse uh, from that slide. But uh, I do want to say, as a m member of the media, and there's just a few of us here, and a couple back there, Amy Rosewater and Roxana Scott, our Olympics editor at USA Today, um, it, to say thank you to all of you. Because I know sometimes we hit you pretty hard, and we ask tough questions, and we're, we're there, and we, we put it out there in millions of newspapers or online or on TV. But without you, we couldn't do it. And thanks for the calls back. Thanks for the the uh, back and forth. Thanks for giving us your ideas and thoughts. I, and so, sometimes we don't say that enough. So Deverona, I'm always calling her for something or other. But thank you to, uh, to all of you for making our wonderful adventure in life as journalists possible. Apollo, again, to all of you. Thank you. Anyway, uh, as, as we see, of course, lacrosse uh, up 218 uh, percent. Steve Stenerson of U.S. Lacrosse Yours is the only sport that is obviously showing this incredible kind of growth. And even with what Tom told us about some of the, uh, the caveats, uh, why don't you just tell us what's going on and how are you doing it? Well, uh, first of all, it, it's easier to grow when your numbers are smaller. And, and as, was, as was suggested, our numbers have been pretty small. Ironically, we're the oldest sport native to the continent, centuries old, but in many cases the youngest sport in terms of uh, more modern play. But I, I think that what we've done um, or tried to do in a very short uh, amount of time is create a national structure, uh, which we haven't had but for about 13 years. We haven't had, an, well, we're non-Olympic, but we have an NGB that's modeled after the Amateur Sports Act. And we've learned a lot from the, NG, the USOC and, and the NGBs that uh, are affiliated, affiliated with the USOC. But I think that national structure in recent years that was formed in 1998 um, has really been a major factor for our growth. It's really focused on our ability to scale resources nationally. Um, I think that um, investment, <laughs> as we've talked about, uh, the sport has been, the modern game, men's and women's, has, has been played for 100 years uh, domestically. But there's never been the type of financial investment that other mainstream sports have seen over the last 100 years. And so that's showed. 
Um, we haven't made strides uh, over, the, over the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s that other sports have made because there was no unified national investment. Um, so we, we've got a long way to go to, uh, to continue to, to reach our investment goals, but um, we've made great strides. And all of that is privately funded. You know, we've had to build a fundraising program like other NGBs um, that's focused on private investment to, uh, and, a, and a national membership program to, uh, to, to identify those resources. Um, also, I think we, we, uh, we have kind of a, a yin and yang of good and bad. We don't have the Olympics. We've got international competitions, world championships, but they're not IOC affiliated. Um, and what that does is enable us to focus on the base of the triangle as was alluded to several times here. Our primary uh, areas of investment are grassroots development, um, uh, seeding teams, educating coaches, advocacy, uh, recruiting officials, and generally trying to, to kind of scale positive growth. Um, and as we said earlier, our, our relative size makes us a little more nimble to be able to have um, kind of more impactful um, a more impactful role in the growth of the game. It's tough when you're soccer and you get three million kids playing. It's tough, I'm sure it's tough to kind of turn that ocean liner a little bit. It's a little easier for us um, in terms of establishing best practices. Uh, the media certainly has helped us um, initially with the former CSTV and CBS College Sports and now with ESPN as well. You know, we've got over 60 live intercollegiate men's and women's games televised annually. That is an incredible catalyst for awareness and growth of our sport, and it's been essential. Um, so I, and I think, uh, just to make a, a point, we've, we're also quite unique, and I think it's, uh, it's reflective of the sport of women's lacrosse. We have, unlike most other sports, we have two distinct versions of our sport, one that evolved from the 30s uh, to be a specifically for girls and women, and one that has evolved uh, back to the 19th century for, for men. So I think that um, has had a very interesting and unique impact on girls and women who now have tremendous opportunity to be able to be competitive athletically and that within the sport of lacrosse have an additional opportunity to be unique. Um, so that's, that's what we're focused on. Well, and you've just brought up an interesting point that we've kind of nibbled at uh, around the, the edges of it today, which is girls is a growth industry. Girls and women is a growth industry. I've always been amazed that sports like golf and Augusta National and others don't do more, not so much because it's the right thing to do, to encourage girls and women to play sports, and we've talked about this a lot, Nancy and Donna, but also because it's just the, it just makes sense financially that this is your growth industry is women and girls, the underserved. As a Northwestern grad, uh, five national titles in uh, lacrosse. We don't get a chance to say we've won too many, many things, do we, Craig? <laughs> but at Northwestern, so we're very, I've been, uh, learned a lot about lacrosse because of my alma mater's success. Is girls and women's lacrosse a growth industry? How positive has that been in that, that number that we saw, the 218%? It's been very positive. It's about uh, two-thirds, one-third, two-third boys and men and one-third girls and women. The girls' game and the, and the women's game is growing at a faster rate, um, w which is wonderful. Um, I think the, the other, I, I do want to make the point I should have made earlier, too. The, the, other, um, the other kind of factor that makes our numbers look impressive uh, which is related to the relative size of participation is the fact that our growth is happening primarily at the middle class and above, um, which, is a, which is a challenge for us. Um, it's not inexpensive to start any sport, um, and lacrosse is, you know, is not soccer in, in terms of uh, its relative expense to the athlete and the families. Our big challenge is going to come with the next three quarters of a million players and how we're going to be able to scale that quality of participation at lower socioeconomic levels at, in areas that are underserved, uh, as, as was uh, stated earlier. That's really the tough part. The, our growth to date has been hard but easier. The next segment of our growth is going to be a lot harder as we, as we seek to introduce this great game, this great sport, to, uh, to folks that have otherwise not had the opportunity to play. Are, do you think part of your success is because you are allowing kids uh, that seems to be your mandate to uh, play other sports, that it's okay. You, they don't have to specialize. In fact, maybe they played soccer and then they just want to throw. And isn't lacrosse a little bit of, you know, soccer with throwing, that all-American motion of learning how to throw. Is, is that part of the success, is the, uh, the, the variety uh, that your kids get a chance to do before they land in lacrosse? Well, we certainly advocate that, but we're not immune to 
the challenges that every youth sports enterprise has in the form of um, private private clubs, which really are, as was as was stated earlier, there there are great private club programs out there, both for profit and nonprofit. But there are also a lot more shingles being hung that are focused more on the business plan than the quality of experience for athletes, and this is impacting us as well, especially as a sport that hasn't driven down uh, in terms of the grassroots from an urban and, and a rural standpoint the way we want to. Um, so that's, that's been an interesting phenomenon. In our, in our sport, what we're seeing is just what we all see, is that sport has evolved from participation to entertainment. It's evolved uh, into much more of a business, obviously. Uh, billions and billions and billions are being invested in the upper levels of the sport, and people are, are, uh, are obviously reacting to that. So. Um, I think that's a real challenge for us. The, the good news and bad news, depending on who you talk to, to me it's good news. We don't have real true professional elements of lacrosse. They're fledgling kind of semi-professional leagues out there. But kids who play lacrosse, at least currently, are not playing with the dream of being a professional, which as we all know is, it, it, it is a dream. Um, for the overwhelming majority. Kids are playing because they enjoy the sport, and if they're playing for anything, they're playing for an opportunity to go to college they want to, um, which is, has its own challenges and, and problems, obviously, so. Thank you. Patrick McEnroe, General Manager of Player Development for the U.S. Tennis Association. This has been a week of good news and bad news. I guess the bad news the New York Times and others uh, emphasized the fact that there's no American man or woman in the top ten, ranked in the top ten in singles for the first time, I, I think, ever. Um, since, since the rankings started. Yeah. Right. And yet, participation up 47 percent since 2000. So why don't you give us a sense of, of how you put in perspective that good news, bad news? Well, if I, if I could first start by just um, thanking Tom for inviting me and being here in, in front of all these people. It's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's amazing to hear what I've heard this morning. And I'd just like to make a couple of comments on, on what I heard before I talk specifically about tennis. But it seems to me that we're sort of looking at two different areas, really, of sports in our country. Uh, many of us at the table who are in individual sports or in the media, I think, would all agree that we're in the have part of the equation. And when it comes to uh, trying to get kids to play tennis or play soccer or play lacrosse or basketball, we're sort of competing with each other to try to get those haves. And the other issue that's here, which the government people are here telling us about, which is really probably the more um, crucial issue is the have-nots and uh, what you know intrigues me about this is what we can do as the haves to try to help the have-nots down the road and not to become professional tennis players or become great college uh, teachers etc coaches and it seems like there's really two different tracks going on here uh, and as far as uh, uh, addressing tennis specifically um, you know, we at the USTA, and I, I run the player development, which is really just in charge of the elite players. Uh, we have the luxury of having one of the largest sporting events in the world, the U.S. Open, that funds everything U.S. tennis does, um, which is why um, Scott doesn't have to pay too much attention to us uh, and, and, the, and the Olympic Committee, because we have the luxury of having a lot of resources. Uh, that being said, um, the rest of the world is caught up to us in tennis. That's just a fact that we're seeing in other sports, too. Um, but we at the USTA realize that uh, we want to get more younger kids playing tennis. I think soccer has, what, about 3 million kids under 10 that play tennis in some sort of competitive environment, whether it's loosely competitive or organized, some kind of organized play. In tennis, there's 20,000 kids only mm -hmm. in the entire country. So while there's some very positive numbers overall participation um, for the under 10, which is why really the biggest single initiative that the USTA is behind now uh, is we call 10 and under tennis, where uh, we are downsizing the court size, we're down to smaller sizing the equipment and the balls so that little kids can start tennis more quickly and more easily and they can put up a, a, a net in a park or in their house, in their driveway, and play tennis and play it 
relatively quickly pretty successfully. Um, so that's a huge initiative. Now when you're talking about getting to you know, my job, which is to try to get elite players, it's really a different, you know, it's a whole different dynamic of uh, trying to get uh, <clears throat> the best kids in the country to, be get, to get to the professional level. And uh, to me, that's not really what this is about. Um, that's our own sort of my drive within the USTA. Um, but it's just uh, to hear, you know, these numbers and to see, the, you know, the, the, I think for tennis, people have this idea that tennis is a country club kind of sport, which is really not true. Um, it's actually pr pretty uh, easy to get started if, you're, if it's accessible. It's actually not that expensive to play. As you get better and more competitive, it gets more expensive, which is a pr huge problem, which is part of the problem for us in the competitive world. Um, but, uh, you know, getting kids to, to, to get out and play, uh, I mean, maybe we all need to spend some money and put a baseball field, a, a small tennis court, a basketball court in, you know, public parks. You know, maybe that's what needs to happen. Um, and, and, you know, if we support it, maybe the government will support it a little bit more. So uh, tennis is, 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 as I said, very lucky um, in the amount of uh, dollars that we can spend, which I think is part of the reason that the numbers are up. And we think the numbers will go up a lot more in the next five to ten years because of this ten and under initiative, which, you know, we're really spending a lot of money. The first lady and her team, you know, did a PSA for, for us, which was amazing, um, all to get, you know, kids moving again. So I think that's part of it, and that's part of all of these different sports sort of jockeying for position. Uh, but again, to me, that's the haves. The have-nots the, is a real problem. Uh, and um, if we can come up with some solutions, ideas of how we, we with the haves, can work together to help ch turn that around, then I think that would be really successful. Patrick, I'd love to get your, your take on an issue that we've talked about a lot, burnout and kids and mm -hmm. pressure on kids. I, Lord knows tennis has had a lot of those kinds of stories, and they go back to Tracy Austin and injuries and, and Jennifer Capriotti. I mean, your sport has probably had given us more poster children on this topic maybe than most. Um, it's, uh, so, it's, it, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's, a, it's still a large issue, and I mean, every, all the stories I hear around the table are echoed uh, tenfold in tennis. Uh, but in a way, we're part of the problem. I mean, we, my job description is to try to create top 100 players. So when I invite kids to come to our full-time training center in Florida at 14, and they live there, you know, that's sending the message. So we as coaches, as mentors, have to do the job and um, not have the expectations necessarily be bigger than what they should be. But at the same time, that's our purpose of ex existence. Same as what Scott's talking about with the purpose of the, the Olympic Committee, we need to win medals. You know, so that's a competitive situation um, that uh, is something that we deal with in our sport. And you know, I had to hear about, you know, there's no top 10 players, whatever that, that's irrelevant to me to the larger issue that we're discussing here. Could you share with us, and uh, yeah, if, if it's possible, what you might say to, excuse me, what you might say to a parent you know, a kid who, a parent, they, they've got a kid who's pretty good. You don't know yet if this is going to be a Wimbledon champion or a college player or just a recreational player the rest of his or her life. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Well, all the kids that we deal with will at least become um, more than likely collegiate players and go on to get, for the most part, a free education, which is huge. You know, tennis is a little bit different than basketball and football where they, you know, college is the obvious next step. Tennis, if if you're really going to make it big time in tennis, you probably won't go to college. And that's hard for academics to hear, but that's just a fact. Uh, that's you look at the, in the top 100 women in the world right now in the world rankings, there's not one player in the top 100 that spent one day in college. From all, and there's about eight or nine American women in that um, group. So that's just a reality. Uh, but what I would say to uh, parents is if you do everything right, meaning in your training, your fitness, your development, your education, um, you have a small chance to make it. Do they want to hear that? You might make it. No, do they don't want to hear it. But, <laughs> do they listen? but they do you have think to they, hear Do you think they listen to you, your name? Your, I don't know. Your, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe not. 
I mean, mm-hmm. it's like, do they listen to, yeah. you know, Coach Robinson because of who he is? I mean, the the end of the day, probably not. Um, but you know, we you know, the, the, we a lot of the kids that come through our elite program, you know, go to college, and maybe they'll make it as pros, you know, even going through college. And then I think we've done our job. You know, we've helped educate those kids, and you know, you learn a lot from being competitive in a high-level sport. And you know, so it's. Uh, but if you do everything exactly right, you have a small chance to make it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's the reality because uh, the rest of the world is caught up to us in tennis, just like in a lot of other sports. You know, it used to be that um, tennis was played by four or five countries for the most part, and that's just not the case anymore. So, uh, and we're still doing pretty well. You know, we still, I think, have second or third most players in the top 100 between men and women. But if we're not number one, then what are you doing wrong? You know, so. Thank you. Rosalind Johnson, your Deputy Director for Recreation Programs in Richmond. You've partnered with the USTA on this quick start tennis, uh, and it's uh, working pretty well. Is that right? It's working extremely well. I'm proud to announce that we are the number three best tennis town in the country. Uh, But (laughs) to piggyback off of what Patrick McEnroe said, the USTA really gets it from a municipal standpoint. Um, they've put money up to refurbish courts, to convert courts to quick start um, facilities. They've given us equipment and supplies. They've trained our staff. So as long as we have the bodies, what more could you do? We have implemented the quick start tennis program in our summer camps. We've implemented it in our after school program. So. The 20,000 um, that Patrick mentioned might just come from Richmond, but um, <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But um, they've made it relatively easy for us to make sure that all of our youth have access to tennis equipment and the game of quick start. The, the 20,000 is just a number that play in some kind of competitive situation. And actually, as Tab talked about in soccer, we're in the process of revamping all of that, you know, so that there will be more sort of play structured, it won't be, you know, a tournament where, you know, you have these kids driving five, six hours, and they lose six, one, six love, and they go home, you know, and spend mm-hmm. the whole weekend. So that, so that's just a number that hopefully will grow because this, at least the studies that we've done have found that to keep uh, kids in a particular sport, yes, they want to play, yes, they want to have fun, but there needs to be some competitive structure that they can be involved in so that they'll continue to stay in the, in, in the game. And that's another key point for us because the tennis tournaments have traditionally been a whole entire weekend, two days, three days, but there are some instances where a tennis tournament can be played in one day, which works for us because we can take our youth to participate in those games one day. We don't have to pay the overnight expense of hotel and lodging, um, but it makes it more achievable for us to be able to participate in the tennis tournaments as well. As you deal with all the time, budgets, uh, these are terrible economic times. We heard the story earlier about Virginia and the governor making that choice to veto that bill. What are you doing to try to make this economical not only for the kids but also for your city? Well, one of the things we do is we don't turn any youth away. We do have scholarships. Um, We are fortunate enough in that we've been funded in such that we can afford to be able to charge our participants $25 for a whole entire season of a particular sport, whether it's football, softball, basketball, it's $25. You talk about the three Ps. We do have people, we have our staff that have been trained through our various partnerships with different organizations. We do have places, but we also provide transportation so that the parents might not necessarily be there, as Coach Robinson mentioned, on a Saturday or a Sunday or during the week. Our staff will take them, we'll transport them. So we have been able to work around that with various partnerships that we have um, and also the programs, the training that I mentioned, our staff are being trained. So it's mainly for us about partnerships because we don't have all of the funding, we don't have have all of the money to do it, nor do our participants, but we try and make it affordable for everyone so that they'll be able to participate. And along those lines, Janet Carter, uh, Executive Director of Team Up for Youth. Um, The biggest barrier, of course, to participation, we've been talking about it all day, is in low-income areas, of course, is just getting these kids uh, out and getting them there and letting them know that this is for them, too. So how do you address that? Well, um, Team Up for Youth exists, thank you, Mom to eliminate that disparity that we've been talking about all day for the have-nots. And we, we don't do that because we think sports for sports' sake 
is really important for kids in low-income communities. We do it because we know that sports does everything that Apollo said and many of you said in terms of the, of the life lessons that <laughs> kids learn from this. And um, if, we don't, if we don't fix this problem, then what low-income kids don't get in increases the disparities and widens the educational and health disparities later on. So we really think it's urgent that we figure out an agenda for this. When we started, one of our main ways of, of eliminating the disparity was to give after-school programs serving low-income communities grants. We learned a really good lesson about four years into that. They, they said, you know what? I said, how, how could we be more helpful to you? They said, you know what? We would like to have volunteer coaches from you. Keep your grants because you, what we do with your grant money is we hire, vo we hire coaches. And then when your grant money goes away, we have to get rid of the coaches and the kids lose out. So at that moment, we started our Coaching Corps program. And, um, and what it does is it takes volunteer coaches from universities and colleges that partner with us and these are universities and colleges, and there's probably not one that isn't like this in the country, that want to give their students a really good community service um, uh, uh, opportunity. I mean, the passion right now that um, students have for doing community service, for learning about youth, youth development, for um, sports, many of them know what sports did to them and did for them, um, is incredible. So we're harnessing that, that passion, and we are taking those students from these coaching core chapters at major universities. We're training them in youth development. We're training them how to use a season to get to teach kids the life lessons that we talked about earlier. And um, we're placing them in after school programs. So essentially, um, what we're trying to do is create a trained workforce so that it can be a sustainable solution to this inequity. Grants are not, we found, of course, a sustainable <coughs> solution, but harnessing the passion of these volunteers are. Um, we just got some really exciting data back from the field, um, some initial data where we were um, measuring fitness levels, where our volunteer coaches had been trained to increase fitness levels for low-income kids. And we found that the highest need, meaning the kids that were scoring in the lo lowest fitness level kids, one in four of them had moved into the fitness levels. And 70% of them had increased their fitness levels by 10%. And that's just getting started. I, I think the harnessing the, the power of volunteers and the, um, is it, I mean, that infrastructure exists in middle income communities. That's how people get sports, because the parents are you know, often the volunteer coaches. And in low income communities, parents love to volunteer as well. We have parents going through our um, volunteer training and becoming coaches. So, um, I think that's really important. Um, secondly, I think we have to stop um, sort of seeing, siloing ourselves when it comes to um, responding to this problem. So we've heard a lot today about after school sports, which happens to be the space that we play in. We've heard a lot about um, recess. We've heard a lot about physical education. And so what we're trying to do um, in, in the Bay Area is bringing really good programs that play in each of those spaces together to say how can we create tools that you as a school district can use to use every single moment in a child's day to get them physically active. So we're working with Playworks, which is an amazing program that, that is in the recess space. We're working with Calford, you know, the physical education folks, and we're working with the after school folks, and we're saying let's not compete and silo ourselves. Let's give districts tools so that they can share the burden or the joy, if you will, of getting kids what they need. Um, and then lastly, I think what we really need to do much better is to, is to get the word out about what we're talking about today around the, di the disparity. You, we see this ha happen time after time. People just don't know it exists. They don't know that we have this huge disparity in terms of the haves and the haves, have nots. And when we document it in a local level, we see parents get really mad and galvanized and become spokespeople. So for example, you know, if you say girls in Piedmont High in a wealthy area, 70% of the girls participate in sports, and three miles down, down the road, 7% do, people go, really? You know, and it's thanks to the great work of the Women's Sports Foundation that that we are even in this country aware of that disparity. And so I think we have to, as we look at solutions, get much better at getting that word out and using it as a way to um, 
to get people galvanized to solve this. Janet, thank you. Amy Perko, Executive Director of the Knight uh, Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. We're talking a lot about grassroots, so now let's work our way up to the uh, NCAA and the, the college level. Uh, how do we get away from focusing so much on college scholarships? We've all said it, we've all thought it. It's the, the, the three-year-old, wow, if he or she can get that college scholarship. What are your thoughts on getting away from that and focusing back on kids playing sports? Um, yes, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, I think uh, the media has done a much better job uh, here recently in terms of really getting the facts out about college sports as it relates to what are the realities of, of scholarships and, and, and really in terms of the percentages, you're going to have a much greater percentage of getting financial aid and an academic scholarship than getting an athletic scholarship. So just the realities of, uh, you know, putting those facts out there. And then, you know, in terms of the work that, that we've been focused on is relates in principle to what this discussion is, is about how do we promote and incentivize behaviors that are tied to the values. And so we're all here because we're talking about the value of participation and the value of opportunity. And related to some of the college sports issues, at least in the, in the big time and, and the, uh, the big time programs, what we've seen is some of the incentives are tied to behaviors that are not pushing us in the right direction. Uh, just as an example, uh, we have advocated for uh, revising revenue distribution formulas so that academic achievement of, of the players is rewarded because now if, if uh, what is rewarded is how your basketball team does in the NCAA tournament. And so instead of the NCAA distributing $180 million this past April just for the success of teams in the tournament, let's change that revenue distribution so that it's tied to how teams are graduating their players and, and promoting the type of values that we believe are important in college sports. Maybe if I can stop you there, Rich Lapchick, of course, does all those surveys we know so well. Mm -hmm. How realistic is this ever ha to happen in this BCS crazy money world of ours? Well, you know, unfortunately the reality is, and, and Tom McMillan uh, had, was on the commission in 2001 when they came up with you know, one of the issues here is we're incentivizing the wrong behaviors. Let's change revenue distribution. Let's also put in a rule that says if teams don't graduate 50% of their players, uh, they're not eligible for a championship, which that's a pretty low standard, but 10 years later, we're still not there. Uh, but I would say that the, the immediate future looks brighter in terms of some of those policy initiatives, really thanks to folks like David Whitman and, and the leadership with Arnie Duncan, when you get those kind of voices behind the need to change policy, um, it, it's more likely to happen. And I think some of the voices, you know, here at this table and, and also speaking with uh, uh, Benita about the, like the NGBs, track and field, if, if we can get those voices in terms of sport and participation and, and talking with university presidents that you know, right now we still do have some, some disconnects because we all know that each layer impacts the other. So if we can say, hey, the policy initiatives in college sports and rewarding the right values really is going to impact, you know, youth sports and, and what our parents are doing and what our parents <coughs> are saying to, to our young people when they're playing um, those sports. I think, you know, just from a parent, uh, I coach our girls in basketball and, and one of the uh, best initiatives I think that's that's been out there and I know some of you have have similar organizations but the Positive Coaching Alliance has done great things and I'm a member of the Positive Coaching Alliance and I I take their online test this is just a reminder about what I should be doing a, as a coach and the more initiatives we can get out there in the public and and just that simple program that uh, parents can take an online test that is not sport specific. It's all about what coaches need to uh, promote and promote participation in youth. And that's an example, I think, of, of one actionable thing that you know we could take away from this that could really help our communities and help parents and help coaches to, as as uh, fall sports start back up. You know, media attention and even just community attention to. Here's what you can do if you're going to volunteer to coach in your community. Take this online test, and it's going to really make you a stronger 
uh, parent in terms of promoting the positive aspects and a stronger coach. Well, thank you. You know, we've got, Tom, we've got, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, until 1.45. Okay, and I know there's, there are three other people that we, we really want to hear from, so I apologize if I'm not letting you all uh, uh, talk as long as we would love to hear uh, from you. But that, Donna, what you mentioned earlier about Gary Hall, senior, actually, the 76 Olympian, w partnering with the, getting these uh, kids to work with, uh, you know, high school kids in that case, right? right? But the colleges, it seems to me, to get college mentors, as we've been talking about, sounds like a great pro plan, and so many people seem to be saying it. My buddy right next to me, Ed Foster Simeon, CEO of the U.S. Soccer Foundation, you've been taking this all in. You've been listening to You probably, you know, could talk for an hour and a half on all these different issues. But one of the things, one of your pet projects is soccer and nutrition. And because you are kind of the bomb in terms of the uh, grassroots level in sports with, with what you have with soccer, why don't you share with us some of those, uh, those points, those uh, best practices with soccer and nutrition? Well, um, we have a program that's um, designed specifically for underserved communities, uh, urban economically disadvantaged areas primarily. And uh, part of the, 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 the concept behind it was it was more than just the soccer that was important to bringing the sport to the community. So we've built a curriculum that in which the soccer skills and soccer training and small-sided games also incorporate into that format of play um, messaging about proper nutrition, what to eat, what to drink, making healthier beverage choices, snack choices, et cetera, and engaging children in a, in a context that they can um, absorb the information in, in an environment where it's fun to them. Um, I have personal experience with my own um, oldest son who's 27 now who eats healthily. He eats healthily because a coach, when he was 11, talked to him about he was fortunate to get a coach who talked to him about the importance of eating healthily. So it's a very simple thing that by training our coaches, what we do, we don't run the programs on the ground. We work with community partners, community-based organizations, nonprofits. But we come in and we provide them with a curriculum that makes it easy for them to incorporate this information, gives them the drills that will give the kids the physical activity, but then talks to them about how to talk to the children uh, about nutrition in a way that is not a lecture, not a half hour sit down in the classroom and here we're going to talk about food, but talking to them about drinking water instead of drinking soda, you know, during, you know, during a break in, in activities. Using those moments in, in, in coaching, at the elite levels, athletes get told a lot about what to eat, you know, about what, how that affects their body. It's just doing the same thing with younger children. And so in addition, we added in um, metrics that we want to measure what the children know at the beginning. And we want to, know, want to know what they know at the end to see whether any of this information is sticking with the children. We think that that's important. Um, I was saying earlier in the day to someone that the youth sports coaches are like an underutilized resource. So much of the emphasis is on the X's and the O's and the winning and, and et cetera, whereas they may be the most influential outside of the parent person uh, that a child encounters in terms of talking to them about staying in school, um, eating healthily, leading a healthy, active lifestyle. These things are incredibly power positions for a coach um, to share that information. And if we make that an outcome that we're looking for from the coaches, not just did you teach them a crossover or whatever move that you're trying to show them, but are you teaching them about nutrition and healthy lifestyles? Are you encouraging them to stay in school? Are you helping them develop important life skills? Those things that every coach is in a position to do that. But um, we don't often ask them <laughs> to do that. It's not part of the job description. In this program in underserved communities that we're doing is that the program's free to the children, we train the coaches, we provide the equipment, and that's so that the coaches are trained to focus on developing the child. Will some good athletes come out of that down the road? Probably so, just as a numbers game, you get enough kids playing. But the majority of them are going to need to be good citizens. They're going to need to be healthy adults. We want them to have soccer as a part of their life um, through adulthood and continue to play. So the ability to incorporate nutritional information into sports program is, is, is not that hard to do if you think about it and figure out that's what we want to do, that we want to incorporate it into the training as we're working with these children. So um, we, we work hard in that area and we also work part in the area of trying to uh, improve the built environment in these communities. Um, you know, saying go play soccer and there's no safe playing field to play on um, is, is, is kind of challenging. 
So we work with parks and recs departments, city governments, anybody who may have some open space uh, to try and improve um, fields. And in some cases, um, we've developed a concept called mini pitches or mini fields, basically, using a small 20 by 30 yard space that we can create into a safe play place for children to play small sided games. And when after school program's not there, that space is still there for children in the community who want to participate in. Yeah, thank you. And we've got two more people to get to for sure. And then I know, Tom, you want to wrap it up. So uh, we haven't heard from you yet, Mike Richter, uh, but uh, superstar NHL player. <laughs> and uh, you have seen it all, the Olympic level, Stanley Cup, uh, you know, all of that at the, at the highest level of your sport. And now you are a youth hockey coach. So with, with that in mind, it kind of runs the gamut. How is USA Hockey making your sport more kid-friendly? Well, uh, I, I just want to echo something that Patrick was saying. We have two tracks going on here. And it's so disturbing to see in America the haves and the have-nots. But that's America. And I'm not excusing that. But let's just say we were all haves. So we had the place built everywhere. That attrition rate that you saw up there is not always because the buildings aren't there. How we've set it up, and Ed, you just spoke to this, how we've set it up, what values we've asked of our coaches, of our players, what the parents have. We were talking about getting better coaching. We also need better parents and better expectation. And I think the really interesting thing is what Steve said and what uh, Todd, you were talking about earlier. 200% increase in lacrosse and God knows what it is in video games. If there was a, prof <laughs> if there was a professional video league or division one video, and there might be, but I mean, if parents were sitting over the shoulder and yelling at a kid saying, how could you possibly have deleted the quarterback or whatever it is, <laughs> we'd have a very different set of kids coming in and out of that. And what does is, what is video games have? It's inclusive and it's fun. My son, uh, I didn't play lacrosse growing up, I played ice hockey, and I'm looking at a very different environment for him to come up and play ice hockey in, and lacrosse. Lacrosse has been a breath of fresh air. These kids are out there because their friends are. This is fun, you're outside, you're playing a sport, and the cream always rises to the top. If you have inclusiveness, these kids will show themselves to be the great ones at 12, 13, 14, or maybe 10, depending on the sport. You don't know, or earlier or later. But what I think is, needs to be spoken about here is, the lack of inclusiveness. Eli and I were talking about, I've got three boys. One's a good athlete, one's a very poor athlete, and one's an excellent athlete. And I'm already seeing three different paths. And it's, it crushes a parent because, you know, like your middle child that, that I happen to have, it's not a great athlete. Why does he not get to have all those benefits, all those benefits that we're talking about in this room? And so for me, the two tracks really come down to one track. What are we asking of sports? What should we be expecting of this? Is it to get to the pros? Is it to get to the Olympics? And I think the big irony is with the USC or anything else, and USA Hockey, that's your question, right? <laughs> I'll come back that's, to it. That's okay. No it's problem. dealing with this, and they're just starting to, that the more people you get involved, the more good athletes you're going to have for whatever chosen sport it is and the healthier society. Tiny, tiny percentage are going to end up playing in Wimbledon or NHL or being an Olympic champion. Everybody's going to be a citizen. What are we teaching those guys? So to drop out early because you're not wanted? No, you've got to teach them those sports and they have to have those things. So I would just say this, that U.S. hockey, it's actually, it's been an education for me. Tom sent this to me and I'm watching it and it has not, I'll just say this, what they've done is fantastic. It has not filled her down. I think this is about three years old, and it should take a long time, unfortunately, to have this really implemented. But it's based on three things. It's called the ADM Building Blocks on Hockey, and it's Athlete Development Module. And uh, play, love, excel. But it's really just what we're talking about. If kids can actually go out and play, and uh, you know, we were speaking about this before. Does it need to be structured? It needs to be fun. So they go out there and have a great time. They'll put time into it. I didn't have any coach parking orders over my shoulder. I wanted to, so I went out there and did more. So it has to be fun. You'll learn the skills, and when you learn the skills, you can excel. But if they're dropping out at six years old, they're not going to end up on the Olympic program. You know, it's just that simple. So I think what U.S. Hockey's done is commendable. I think it's quite, quite good. I don't know whether it's going to be implemented, because in the end, the coaches, the structure, you know, there are rinks, there are people out there, but what do these people want, and what does the structure have. So if we've given them the place, the arenas to play in, in this case ice hockey, and you've given them a good structure, I, I'm not sure it's going to be implemented because every parent wants their kid to be a pro, well, not every parent, but too many do. And, and, and I think the, the focus should be more on developing good citizens 
you'll still get your pros, you'll still get your, in fact, I think you'll get more. There, it's a false choice between fun and, and um, excellence. Mike, I have about 75 follow-up questions, but I want to get to our, sure. our final person and then throw it back to Tom. Thank you, and thanks to, again to everyone. Uh, Nancy Hogshead Maker, we, you and I have discussed this a lot. Title IX, uh, Women's Sports Foundation, you are a huge advocate. Benita over here, of course, Donna Deveron is our role model and leader on this topic. Um, I'm making you czar of, of the world. Uh, with, with girls sports and Title IX, give us uh, your thoughts on what you would do, what you would tell all these folks, uh, about uh, not only gender specific, uh, gender neutral words, not to use guys anymore, but to use uh, you know boys and girls, what have you, in our conversation today and always. But also uh, the bigger picture. What would, what would you do if I, if you had the power to, to do it? Sure. Um, in two minutes or less. So yes, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. <laughs> so um, you know, t um, at the turn of the century, this country started, it implemented sports with its educational system as a way to build good men, as a way to build the characters that we wanted really for soldiers. And so when Title IX came along, <clears throat> Title IX is sort of a neutral statute. It just says if there's federal funds involved, then you just, you have to divide those equitably. But when Title IX came along, it really, women got the benefit of the fact that we had invested so much in boys' sports. That the, so they, it meant the sea change for women being able to uh, be involved and, and to, to get it. But here's the thing, Title IX is neutral in terms of what kind of sports programming is offered. So if there is this, you know, this model that Mike was just talking, you know, this inclusive model and that Janet was talking about that includes everybody, then Title IX will be a wonderful force for meaning that that girls have that opportunity to do that too. If it is instead a system that is a weed out system, this the type that in Tom, your book, which I just love, talks about is the, this weed out system of having these select clubs, then Title IX isn't gonna do anything to be able to change that. So it's a content neutral, in other words, sort of whatever's provided, it, all the statute just said is just equality between boys and girls. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, um, so, so when we're talking about how do we change the, the sports model to be this inclusive model, to include people from these people who are formerly not included in our, our system, <clears throat> um, um, you know, we're, we're really talking about a non, it's not centralized location, it's not you know, centrally governed type of sports model and we're asking all these disparate groups, all the people sitting at this table, to make the necessary changes to be able to have that happen. Um, we're still seeing too much of our history of sports, of this sort of defining masculinity as a way of um, keeping girls out. I mean, one of the things, you know, I love the <clears throat> demonstration here about, you know, this amazing game that's going on with, um, with EA and the Madden game, but you know, it's really a celebration of masculinity. It's a celebration of men. And so, you know, we need to have games like that that really include girls and give them a place so they can say, you know, I can do that. You know, I can be that. Or I, there's a place for me there. Um, to have a disabled athlete say that, you know, there's a place for me there. That I, I can, I can, I'm a, I'm a viable member of that group that's there. So, and as long as we, as long as we think about athletics in those terms, as long as we think about them sort of on a binary scale and not realizing that, you know, we're all human and these are very human characteristics. Um, one of the beauties of what Title IX has taught us is, um, is it gave us, it has given us this wonderful opportunity to look at, um, at uh, what sports actually does for people. Right, so we have, we have this wonderful before and after of pre title line. Very few girls playing high school sports, about three hundred thousand. Now we're up to three point one million. Um, so you got a before and after. And so what was happening in the workforce during that time? What was happening education during that time? What was happening health during that time? So we're able to say what what sports means is much more. Sort of everybody here, sort of intuitively, you know, we have, you know Apollo here with his experiences. We all have great experiences of what sport has meant to individually and we can look and see what other people. In fact, social science bears it out. There's a lot of research out there, empirical, peer-reviewed research showing that it means more education, regardless of where the kid come from, comes from. 
um, if they come from black, white, Hispanic, urban, rural, or suburban, um, it means more education for that kid. It means um, uh, um, it means more full-time work employment. It means lifelong healthier people. It means um, um, if they're girls in particular, they're much more likely to go, to go into non-traditional fields. So it means a better educated, better prepared workforce. So the, the argument that there is out there, the argument that a social scientist, that a law professor um, would make in terms of what, what we know from Title IX and the sort of this huge zero to 60, you know, growth in sports, of what that means for our workforce, what that means for everybody sitting here around this table um, is is amazing. These gifts are not allocated just to NBA players. These gifts that we have out here are available to every kid who walks out there and participates in sports. Yes, you after 40 years, almost yeah. 40 years, yes. what are the changes that we can celebrate about women's sports? What are the changes we can celebrate? Well, yes. going from just under 300,000 to 3.1 million is a huge sea change um, in having a, just under 50% of all girls playing sports. Yep. But when you're talking, you're talking about celebrations that are examples for children. The numbers don't make it. What do you tell children that they can, young girls that they can celebrate that make a difference for them? You can give them all the numbers you want, and I'm a numbers guy, but. <laughs> <laughs> but what what what, oh, what, what concretely oh, can oh, yeah, we look no. to? Yeah, if my audience is Congress, I would say everything I was just saying. If my audience is young kids, I would talk about um, about about staying in sports, about um, you know ha ha the the kinds of friends. You know, you may not realize it now, but the kinds of friends that you're going to make are really going to be your lifelong friends. I've got about just under a thousand people on Facebook. Fully 250 of my Facebook friends are swimmers, people that I swam with back. You know. 27 years ago now, right? And that's a lot of people for a, just a finite, segmented part of my life. Um, is, that, is that the kind of thing you were asking for, John? No, I was thinking about things that when you were talking about celebrations, the, the masculinity uh, syndrome of celebrating uh, championships, victories, right. and whatever, that is, that is very uh, image-oriented and concrete, as right. opposed to um, conceptual and theoretical. Sure. Well, John, if, if I, just a thought and then Nancy, you can go ahead. Yep. But the, the notion that uh, we are giving girls the opportunity that boys had for generations only. You know, whatever that girl's going to be that you see every day in the kitchen in the morning. If she's going to be a mom, a doctor, a lawyer, she'll be better at it for having played sports, which are some of the c comments here. But to see something that looks like you, uh, with all due respect, to just see men playing sports, I would hope, again, the growth industry, Todd, would be that you would have make a whole girl sports game and be able to sell it like crazy. Now, maybe it won't sell as well as the boys, but, um, you know, I think that's part of it. So I think we saw it already with, uh, with politics, John. Uh, you know, it may not be um, pro leagues. We're not seeing that yet. And we may not see that for forever. Who knows? But participation is the victory, and the victory has already been had. Um, it's, and then go ahead. Wait, Donna wait. De Verona says World Cup 99. Wait, 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 and just one real quick. You know, there was no I'm real gasps yeah. out here by people in this room at the differences between boys and girls. Those differences between boys and girls are structural differences. The girls do not play this game because they do not have a team. The, the demand for sports is tremendous for both boys and girls. I mean, I see it in lacrosse a lot. So you see a lot of boys that want to play lacrosse, but a lot of girls do too. And the, those are structural barriers that are not allowing girls to be able to play those sports. When you look at the differences in community softball versus baseball fields and leagues, no. it is an embarrassment that we would ever ask. We would allow our girls to see how we formally treat boys and girls as being different. Um, it used to be that most of the phone calls we got were softball and baseball. But the, the difference between a high school softball and baseball facility is to have a defense lawyer talk to me about trying to argue that really what I'm seeing is equal when the girls they don't have they don't have batting cages they don't they didn't their their bench was literally like a bench um, that all all the girls couldn't sit on it and they had to sit on the ground that the parents were taking care of the field that had big holes in it that um, they didn't have a place of storage they didn't have a concession area they didn't have bathrooms it, and the boys had all this and more. They had what looked like sort of a triple A field. And the, uh, the lawyers arguing with me about why this is really equal. Nancy, really what year equal? was this? 
What year was that? That the, uh, that's four years ago. 2007. 2007. Yeah, and 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 and, um, and I said, well, you know, if they're so equal, let's just swap. <laughs> you can, you exactly. can see, one of the things I think is so powerful is you see little boys like having role models that are women. Right. You know, I think that's, when I, I know for me growing up, like a Mia Hamm, you know, was my idol. You know, and so I think the ability now for this transformation of that women athletes and women in our society to be able to achieve that as a human right, you know, I think that really speaks volumes. So you have these stories and you have these narratives that, you know, and sometimes I'm like, why aren't they being told more? You know, we could really capture them because these are what inspires youth, male, male and female. And you know, that, that's the thing that's most powerful for me. The, um, you know, I'd like to bring uh, Apollo into this uh, again and, and, uh, and Steve Spinner as well. You know, we've been doing a lot of talking about team sports, right? A boy has a <clears throat> boys have a team, girls should have a team as well. But there are also individual sports out there. You know, in this country, we, we tend to sign our kids up for the same four or five sports, right? And they often, uh, uh, you know, emphasize the same type of skills. It's hand-eye coordination. It's explosive muscle action. Um, but there are a lot of other sports out there that kids might be perfectly tailored to play. Um, and I, so I'm curious to know uh, from you, Apollo, um, you know, uh, how, how do we get? How do we introduce more kids to these second-tier sports? Well, um, I, you know that's a great question. Uh, you know, sports like speed skating, which are not uh, as big as the major sports in the United States. You know, I, I wanted to, to box and play football growing up. My dad said no. Uh, he didn't want me get. He, he didn't want me to get hurt. So I was a swimmer, and then I kind of stopped growing. So that was out the window. Uh, I saw speed skating on TV. That's how I got involved. It wasn't something that was readily available in my neighborhood or where I grew up. Um, we had to drive, I grew up in Seattle. We had to drive back and forth to Vancouver, BC. That's where I learned how to speed skate, by watching and learning. Um, but like many kids who probably watched the past few Olympics or Winter Games, mm -hmm. they saw short track speed skating for the first time on TV. Um, and then therein lies the challenge of the USOC providing funding to the NGB, and then it's the NGB's um, so-called, you know, responsibility to then develop the grassroots level. The issues are obviously funding, infrastructure, and then getting the coaching, and then getting the players. Um, I was recently in Singapore helping develop some Special Olympics programs for the Singapore government. Um, now you're talking about a government there that is not focused on ac on athletics whatsoever. Their primary focus is on academics solely. Um, and a very, very high level of intellect group of people who, who live and reside there, mostly investment bankers. Okay, so they're, they're starting to realize the power of what sports can do for a community, but they have no idea, no, con no concept of how to build something like that. We do. We have a history as a country of, of developing grassroots level, but trying to get kids interested in sports that are not baseball, that are not football, that are not soccer and swimming, things that I consider mainstream sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you can just go down the street DC and go throw on some speed skates and go practice speed skating. I and mean, it's totally different. It's a really obscure sport that's actually very technical and very specific <laughs> in terms of the infrastructure that you need and doing so. But I think it's up to us to allow the kids to have that opportunity uh, to, in order to play. Um, because there's, like you said, there's plenty of sports out there that are, indivi that are individual sports, um, but still, that still embody the team values. I mean, my sport, short track speed skating, is, in, is an individual sport. I mean, I race alone primarily, mm -hmm. although I train with a team. We train with both the ladies and the men mm -hmm. on the same time, uh, on the same ice surface, at the same time, you know, six hours a day. So the values are still there. It's just that when the stage is set, we compete, you know, solely on our own. Um, the, the challenge, like I said, really lies in, in, in building the grassroots level and its funding. Yeah. Um, without the infrastructure of a place to play, um, you're not going to get some inner kitty sids from you know kids from Chicago, with the ability to go skate or speed skate. They don't even know what it is. You know they, they have no idea what speed skating is or some of these other Olympic sports. Have you seen any examples out there of um, you know just a best practice, some club that figured out that they gave opportunities to a kid through scholarships or through some unique partnership or uh, I don't I don't know. I mean you know Shawnee Davis I know uh, right. Uh, um, you know, it was Shawnee Davis, you know, he grew up on the south side of Chicago. He was in a really unique situation. I mean, his mom was essentially, you know, it allowed him a, an outlet to do something that was different mm -hmm. um, from basketball or football in his neighborhood. 
uh, and they essentially they moved to the north side, which was a safer area in Chicago, and that's how he began his his career, career as an athlete. Um, but he, but Shawnee was very much a unique situation. There's not very many African American male or female athletes in speed skating. It's predominantly whites. Right. Um, we have a few Hispanics. Um, I'm half Japanese, but. Uh, it, it's it's difficult because most people don't even know that it exists the opportunities for athletes, right. um, and you know I, I just I just stress the funding and the infrastructure part because without those fundamentals you really don't have a basis. Um, and and I mean look I, I can I can tell you hundreds of stories of me walking to the airport or meeting people or going to speak with with corporations or organizations, and then the parents or the kids themselves telling me that during the games they want to become speed skaters and how do they do so. And here I am being, you know, one of the champions of my sport, telling them, I, I'm not really sure, you know. Like, I mean, I don't really know how, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I started by, I was, I was luckily two and a half hours away from some of the best skaters in the world. Mm -hmm. And then I went and joined a program. But outside of the Olympic Training Center, which is the elite of the elite, there's really not much. Uh, there is programs. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a few scattered across the country, but not enough. Not like tennis, not like soccer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need. But mm -hmm. regardless of the fact, um, for me, I don't care what sports kids play. It doesn't matter to me as long as they're playing something because it, 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 there's just so many values there that coincide. And I think for, for too long as a country, we've separated academics and sport into two different entities. Um, but I think theoretically they should be combined as one, given all of the, the current research that's showing how much better uh, academically uh, you know, kids and, and, and students perform when they're involved with sports and vice versa. And um, mm -hmm. aside from the fact that it just, it just keeps kids healthy, you know, I mean, let's, the Let's Move program initiative is, is probably one of the best prominent and, and, and the most effective ways of keeping kids active and healthy. And I think kids, you know, generally speaking, we're speaking about a lot of problems and issues that we have in the sporting world, but generally speaking, I think our country is at least becoming more aware of the issues that we have. And it's, you know, not just shying away from them. We are starting to recognize that. It's just, I think, implementing those ideas and saying, yes, we are going to make a change and this is how we're going to do so. But right. without the right infrastructure and funding, it's just kind of talk. It's tough. So I want to bring Steve Spinner into this conversation. I, I met Steve a few years ago when I did a story on his company at the time. It's called Sports Potential. It's now in hibernation, I guess. It was sort of uh, iTunes uh, before there was an iPod. Uh, it, it's this, uh, it, it's, I'll let Steve kind of explain what it is, but um, I was sort of fascinated with the possibilities of, 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 of just what he was trying to do. And um, so, I, I mean, Steve, in terms, of, in terms of matching kids up with sports like speed skating or all these Olympic sports, I mean, they're, inc they're incredible Olympic level athletes in, in inner city Baltimore who just aren't being hooked up with uh, you know, uh, sports and clubs that they, they, they you know, they might enjoy uh, playing with. Um, wh wh what have you learned? Yeah. Um, if you could just give me a second to, to preface it with a short story to put it in proper context, because no one here probably has ever heard of sports potential, um, except maybe some of the NGBs and, and the United States Olympic Committee. So, um, Steve Spinner, uh, I was born with the fat gene. Uh, I don't mean to kid about that, but if my family, if we don't work out, we gain weight. Uh, so bad that I lost both of my parents, unfortunately, because of obesity-related issues. And so I was always raised in a family where you had to do something physical, or otherwise you'd have issues like my parents. So as you can see, well, we're all seated. I'm 5'6". Uh, I'm a little overweight because I'm, I'm uh, spending too much time working right now. However, growing up, I first played Little League. And I played baseball growing up, and it was great in elementary school. And then in junior high, I didn't grow as much as the other kids, um, and so I started playing soccer. And again, was doing actually quite well, but knew that I wouldn't do the high school. But one thing that happened is I could run all day on the soccer field. And the high school cross-country and track coach came and saw the soccer team play one day, just went for, a, I guess, eventually a talent identification, I guess. And he saw that even though I might not have been the fastest kid on the team, I never got winded after three hours of running. So he approached me and just simply dared me to run in the high school race the following week with the high school students. It was not allowed. It was, you know, probably he would have gotten in trouble for it. Um, but I was young, naive, very competitive, and I took him up on the dare. I ran the race, and I won the race. And I was in eighth grade. So uh, because of that, I then found running. 
It was not a sport that my family or friends ever talked about at the dinner table. We talked about the typical baseball, basketball, football, most of the hand-eye coordinated sports and maybe soccer on the, on the foot eye as well. And always the team sports. But never the individual sports, never, certainly never the less popular sports. And so I found running and it changed my life. And I then did it all throughout, I wrote my college applications on Senator Bill Bradley and the balance of um, sound mind and sound body principle. Uh, I then did that all throughout college. I excelled academically. I won scholar athlete of my university. It then helped me uh, get into business schools. I went to HBS. It changed my life. And uh, eventually, after all that, I actually worked for the Atlanta Olympics because it was a way for me to combine all my passions. And at a certain point, I, I said, luck should play a role. It shouldn't play that large a role in life. And there's got to be a better way I could have found out about running other than through pure serendipity. Wouldn't it be great if there could have been a test that evaluated physical, physiological, behavioral, psychological, to give me information? Not about what I could be an Olympic athlete about. Honestly, I could care less about that. The system's great once you're in the system at the elite levels and especially the Olympic levels. But what if I could just find out stuff that I might be good at at an early level? And I love the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sport Test when I was a kid. I remember it. I'm turning 42. I remember it 30 years ago. I loved it. It wasn't enough. It told me that I did well on this test, but not well on that test. But it was not tied to sports and certainly not tied to recommendations. So what we did is we said, what if we, and I'm living in Silicon Valley and everyone's starting companies at that time. So I said, well, what if we could um, evaluate to first work with Stanford's biostatistics department, work with the United States Olympic Committee, all the national governing bodies for all the different sports, and work with, um, uh, work with professional teams where they weren't Olympic sports, et cetera, to get baselines of what actually makes elite athletes, and then be able to build software that with various inputs, you could get outputs of saying recommendations of sports. But the best thing about what we tried to do is we were essentially sport blind. Okay? It wasn't a test on one sport, which there are a test out there right now. There's a soccer sport, a test, and a football test, or all these different. All sports were equal. Team, individual, winter, summer, popular, less popular, they're all equal. And it's all about inputs coming in outputs. And so um, what we did was we found out something really interesting. It was an aha day. The, bio, the Stanford guys called us up and said we did it. And it was that we proved from a scientific standpoint that everybody's good at something. Okay? I'm sitting here next to my, sorry, I'll try not to get emotional. I'm sitting here next to Mike and he says, I've got one kid that's great, one kid that's good, and one kid that hasn't found, that, that's not good. And I, we proved that that last one is factually incorrect. That child has not found his or her sport yet. Okay? We proved it. It's there. It's in the science. So what we did is we then, um, we built, the, take the science and built software around it. And we made a great, um, great uh, website, et cetera, and we started trying to commercialize it. But it took four years to do it. And what happened was is that because we, we cared so much that the inputs were accurate, you give the wrong evaluation here, test here, wrong test there, it's bad inputs in, really bad outputs coming out. And we were very sensitive about that. So we refused to do that until we could have a process where it was an actual certification for testers. And we could test this in schools, camps, health clubs, gyms, universities, and so forth. We were too early. In order for people to sign up for it, we had to charge. In order to, for it to pay, to have certified people do it, they had to get paid. It ended up being, on a group test, it would be $50. On an individual test, $125, $150. We could not do that as a for-profit company. This is the best part about it. In order to build the company, to build these products, we actually had to be a for-profit. I had to have engineers, uh, computer scientists, everyone like that, to build the products, OK? In order to monetize it and commercialize it, it actually would have been best for us to be a nonprofit like half this room because all the uh, Fortune 500 companies could actually give us a $5 million check to test this school, that, you know, that community, this state, et cetera. But as a for-profit, we couldn't. And so that's where it was amazing that, um, that I've been waiting for this meeting for nine years, Tom. <laughs> I really have. Because, you know, seven years ago, you came in, and I was so scared of you coming in, uh, this investigative journalist coming in to take a look at herself. 
and it worked great, you, have, you got tested, your results came out great, your kids got tested, their results came out great, and the stories are extraordinary. Uh, Steve, was, Steve was afraid that I was going to paint him like the East German sports <laughs> empire, you know, where you test kids and you place them in the sport and that's their path for life. And I'm happy to show the actual product itself later on in the last session or afterwards if anyone's interested, and I certainly don't want to dominate, but um, it, it allowed us to be able to, um, what, what, what ultimately what happened was, was that we said, you know what, we're ahead of our time. You know, we built a new product, but we can't build a new market simultaneously. Just can't do it. Um, it's not there. Let's not be like 99% of other companies and go out of business. The board was supportive. All the employees were supportive. Let's do what they call a hibernate. The, the value is in the products. The products haven't changed. Let's lock them down. Let's wait for the market to evolve. Let's wait for the market to get to the point where we can commercialize it, whether it be us or some other entity. Let the products live another day and let's all go on with our, our lives. And I, as I said, I've, I've served. I'm now in clean tech and so forth. But the science is still there. The products are still there. It's a, it's, I'm not saying it's the, it's a solution that is there for people in the room for the next decade. Um, and I've got something to share in the fourth conversation. If it's okay with you, I'll, I'll save that for the yeah, fourth. Yeah. Unless you, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we've got to kind of move you, on here a little go bit. To this. We, um, let's see, I mean, we, we were supposed to break uh, 10 minutes ago and, and sit back uh, down in two minutes, which I don't think that's going to happen. Um, is, does anybody object to us just rolling through until 3 o'clock? Is that okay? Uh, All right. Okay, yeah, and if you, if you have to leave, uh, whenever, please. Um, um, can I say something? Because I have to leave, but I just wanted to give a, I don't think I'm on the panel to speak, and I just wanted, no, I'm the please. only, I think, physician that's sitting around the table, and I yep. just wanted to give an input from the physician aspect of what I see, because I think, I think you are very much correct that we need to change parents' mentality of it. Because I see all the time, we know sports and athletes develop over time, and some kids are developed early and the other kids catch up. And so I have people coming in at age nine all the time wanting to know why their child is no longer the fastest. There has to be something wrong if they used to be the fastest person. And it's very hard to explain to a parent that they were mature and now everyone's catching up. And I think when we're talking about, and I think the whole scope of this whole conversation is how to keep kids involved. Well, how we keep kids involved, as my husband said, who's a, he's one of those athletes that he played college lacrosse and football and then became a tennis pro, and I never could figure out why you could do all of those sports and be good at it, because there are some people that have genetics on their side. And you take a good genetic eye-hand coordination and a good coach can make them good at almost any sport. Yeah. And so what we need to do is we've got those kids, they could play five sports, and they will eventually find the sport that they excel at. What we need to do is take the kids that are not as good and let them play sports and have fun doing it and keep them involved. And I think what we're seeing in my profession, what I'm seeing is an incredible amount of overuse injuries at age nine because they see that to be a professional athlete, they need to specialize, specialize early and do year round sports. And I think if this panel, and we've got some big organizations working on campaigns to stop overuse and trauma and prevent this, but I think if we took all of these groups and you took the elite athletes and said, you know, the goal is not to be an elite athlete and subspecialize when you're seven. The goal is to be healthy. And we won't see this. Well, let me say, and this is a question for you. I want to bring David Whitman into this here. Uh, the reason that's happening is because parents are chasing scholarships at age nine. Can you ever see uh, what are athletic scholarships? They're 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 uh, they're athletic aid. They're not really academic aid. They're controlled by the athletic department. If the coach doesn't think you're good enough. They can pull the scholarship the next year if he wants. Um, you know, I mean, is there is there is there a question to be asked? And in, in, in maybe I should leave this in the in the in the the, the next session there. But I mean. Uh, does, the, does the NCAA or do colleges, I mean, should we look at this whole idea of, in, uh, of colleges incentivizing the youth sports landscape to focus so hard on, on scholarships, the, you know, the, the seeking the, you know, the, the big payoff? Well, I, 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 um, I think that the question And I apologize. David is with the, uh, the Department of Education. Um, I think um, Secretary Duncan uh, would say that the whole sort of AAU circuit is insane. I, I mean that there was a I, there was a story in the 
New York Times Magazine several years ago, I think it was about a 12-year-old player, um, Alonzo Trier, um, who was already being uh, recruited for colleges in a kind of sub rosa way. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody defends that kind of practice. Um, the question is sort of what can the education department do or not do about it? Um, and I think there is um, sort of a good news, bad news aspect to um, the situation at the moment. Uh, the good news is uh, that I, I think the Secretary has uh, as much uh, personal involvement and personal experience with the issue of uh, collegiate sports and high school sports as probably any, anybody who's ever going to fill that position. Um, it's a very personal issue for him. Uh, he, he obviously played professional basketball himself. Uh, his, his sister played collegiate basketball and also played briefly overseas. Uh, his, his father was the University of Chicago representative to the NCAA. Uh, I'm not sure if Karen is still here or not. Um, but she, she works with Kaboom. Uh, Arnie's a big supporter of, of, of Kaboom as well. Um, so that, that's part of the good news. And he very much recognizes and gets the idea that uh, sports develops leadership skills. Uh, apart from perhaps the military, sports is the biggest developer of, uh, of, of leaders in, in, in the country. Uh, the bad news is that uh, the involvement of and the potential involvement of, of, the, of the federal government in this issue is very limited. Uh, more than 90 percent, 92, 93 percent of all funding uh, for K-12 education um, is state and local funding. And the funding situation, as several people have alluded to, is very, very bleak. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, Secretary's referred to this as the new normal. And uh, because state and local budgets uh, have to be balanced, which is not like the federal budget, there, in most states there is a constitutional requirement that you have to balance the budget. Um, and because uh, school revenues are based heavily on, on local tax revenues and there's been a crisis in the real estate market and there's a delayed valuation, delayed, uh, depleted tax revenues coming in. Um, for the next several years, the, the reality is that uh, almost every school district in the country is going to be facing enormous pressure to cut programs, including sports programs. Um, so there are a few sort of mitigating, uh, potentially mitigating factors here. Um, uh, one is um, Title IX. Um, uh, I think Title IX is one of the great su greatest success stories of, of the last three or four decades. Uh, anytime you have a tenfold increase in uh, high school sports, that's really stunning. Uh, uh, but as, a, as an enforcement mechanism, Title IX is, is going to be somewhat limited. I mean, it's absolutely the case that there should never be a disparity in the kind of opportunities that are offered uh, to boys and girls in terms of sports, just as there should never be a disparity in the uh, AP classes or this, uh, the kind of rigorous curriculum that you find that's, that should be available to low-income students and uh, upper-income students. Um, and so, but. But Title IX is a kind of slow uh, enforcement mechanism. Um, the other aspect of this is that you can either make smart cuts to school budgets or you can make dumb cuts to school budgets. And um, the Secretary's argument is that right now a lot of school spending is not done very efficiently. Uh, and there's been some references to this um, earlier in terms of sports, spending on sports as well. Um, so one possibility that he's been very supportive of is after-school sports. Um, 
his belief is that schools should basically be owned by the community. Uh, he introduced more, there are more community schools in Chicago than there are anywhere in the United States. Uh, his whole point is that schools should get out of, and particularly after school providers, should get out of the brick and mortar business. Every school in the country, virtually every school in the country is a gym. Most of them have pools. They have athletic facilities. And uh, when the school day, the formal school day ends, we ought to just turn those incredible facilities over to after school providers to uh, let them run after school programs, um, including sports programs. Um, the other, there's two other arguments that he makes for the importance of retaining sports as part of uh, the essential of what's offered in schools. One is that that sports are kind of uniquely positioned to develop what we think of as 21st century <laughs> skills, uh, skills of teamwork, uh, sk skills of adaptability, uh, persistence. Uh, you have to practice sports to get good at it, although there's an occasional uh, pure talent, but that's not really the way most athletes succeed. Um, and those are the kind of, of skills that um, are, are kind of uniquely taught by sports. Uh, the other part of it is that you got to give kids a reason to come to school. And um, sports are fun. Uh, and that's, you know, just like uh, arts and music are often one of the reasons kids want to come to school, sports is also one of the reasons. So uh, in terms of reducing dropout rates uh, and, and other aspects of uh, sort of strengthening the education system, um, uh, sp sports are a big plus as well. So the, the big picture is uh, a, a limited federal role, very limited uh, in, a, in a whole bunch of respects, but uh, a lot of sympathy and a lot of support for the idea that um, sports should be considered uh, a necessity in school, not, not a luxury. And so if I could comment on that, Stacy with the National Recreation and Park Association. David, I want to comment on, um, on your remarks regarding uh, schools getting out of the business of, um, you know, providing after school sports and, and, and recreation opportunities. And obviously, park and recreation agencies throughout the country are perfectly positioned and poised to be able to, to step into to that role um, through joint use agreements. And I know that there are a lot of uh, communities throughout the country that, that engage in that, and there have been tremendous benefits. Um, for example, I lived in, in northern Virginia, and there is a middle school that um, did not have um, the funding to maintain a, a field next to to the school and so they joined forces with the local park and recreation agency so that during the day the school uses that field for you know for their gym classes and, and PE classes whatnot but then on the weekends and in the evenings the park and recreation agency comes in and they use the field for community sports and they have committed to, to maintain those fields um, so a lot of tremendous benefit that can be gained from from joint use agreements as I've said here today, I've heard um, more than, than one person around this table talk about the importance of uh, parks and, and recreation. And without a doubt, you know, park and recreation agencies um, like, like Richmond um, certainly create the, the places, pl spaces, and programs for sports throughout the country. Unfortunately, and I think that we all agree that um, you know, they, they play an important role with sports, and not just sports for youths, but sports for adults as well. Unfortunately, I think that a lot of us just naturally assume that park and recreation facilities are always going to be there. And that's unfortunately not the case, because as we're seeing throughout the country now, as local communities are starting to, to look at cutting budgets, one of the first things to get cut is the, the park and recreation budgets. So if we really want to make a difference with sports, and again, I'm not talking sports just for youth, I'm talking sports at all, at, for all ages, um, you know, we really need to start advocating at the local level for the fact that parks and recreation agencies and the sports programs, they're not just luxuries, that they really are essential services and have an important role to play within the communities.
much. Um, okay, well, thanks, Stacy. Um, by the way, I, uh, I should have mentioned earlier, um, there are supporting documents in each of your packets there, including a two-page or one-page handout on um, what's happened to federal funding of uh, parks in recent years, as well as um, several states that have uh, found ways, uh, including the city of Chicago, uh, or as well as the city of Chicago, to uh, to, to fund recreation parks and, and otherwise. So uh, again, there's some best practices in your in your document as well. Um, and out on the table, of course, there are books um, and there are supporting materials about what Mike Richter referred to with um, USA Hockey, a whole explanation of their long-term athletic development model, which is a, a lot to convey. It's probably better just to read it or uh, pick it up, picking up the document or going going on the website. So. I apologize for not uh, encouraging you to do that um, earlier. Tom, what, what does it take? Uh, your book is wonderful. Uh, and I know a lot of authors that have uh, written books recently that are uh, prescribed reading for incoming freshmen in colleges. What does it take for high schools or colleges to prescribe as a necessity, as a part of the curriculum, a book like Game On? Well, I mean, I, I, it seems to me like it's a no, you know, given what we're talking about here all day, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, David probably. We'll provide the copies. Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I don't know, you know, it's, um, th there are more, I know there are more than a dozen universities that have it as a required text, but I, I don't know, David, I mean, what, what is it? You're from the education the, world. What does it take the, to get get a, get a book into a school? And, and, and maybe school. maybe it's Mark's book too. I mean, there are a lot of people, yes. you know, uh, Daryl Hammond's book. Uh, please, this is not meant to be a, a shill for just my book. But how do you get good literature into into schools? I guess is the question. Uh, the high school textbook uh, system is uh, remarkably disorganized and splintered, um, and. I actually wrote a monograph on this a few years ago called The Mad, Mad World of State Textbook Adoption. But uh, in about half the states, there is a statewide uh, textbook adoption policy. There's a board that, that reviews textbooks and that authorizes what's going to be used in every school. Uh, this market is totally controlled by the existence of, by the California uh, textbook. Uh, uh, and, this, and the Texas state textbook adoption. California has very liberal, uh, sort of politically correct uh, requirements about its textbooks. Texas has uh, very conservative uh, uh, requirements for its textbooks. So what the textbooks publishers do is basically dumb down their textbooks to the point where they are satisfactory both to California and to Texas. Uh, and then virtually all the other states, because of the <coughs> difficulty of particularizing textbooks, um, end up adopting the textbooks that are used in California and Texas. Hmm. So it's, um, it's a very poorly constructed system. Uh, there, is, there is no system, really, in, in higher ed for requiring textbooks um, in public universities. Is there any way for the D Department of Education to, and let's set aside these books here, but what about like good coaching manuals or, I mean, we, we need trained coaches, right? So how, in terms of pushing good coaches' education down the pipeline, is there anything the Edu Department of Education can do to try to get, force, force coaches to learn some of these techniques where we know yeah. are valuable? There, there really isn't. Uh, the, in fact, there is a, by federal law, the, de the, the U.S. Department of Education is barred from prescribing curriculum, uh, both in K-12 or in higher education. Um, so uh, it's simply not a function of, of at the federal level that, that, I, that I'm aware of at all. Gotcha. Okay, so I want to uh, summarize, and, and Mara, are you uh, around there? We're going to do this quickly. Um, I have uh, I noticed about 10 things that people said that I think are worth putting on the board and uh, can be takeaways. And we will work all these up later and send those to you, OK? Uh, there will be reports that will come out of this for each uh, related to each one of these sessions. We're going to get the, uh, these sessions transcribed. We're going to create something that's manageable that you can read and not ask people to watch six hours of uh, us talking. Um, and hopefully is a tool uh, that will be used by 
uh, not only this group but uh, folks beyond um, our circle. But uh, so, so here's some of the, in terms of best practices, here's some of the things that I heard. Um, you know, Steve Stenerson talked about, you know, advocate, uh, advocate for playing multiple sports. Don't try and lock kids into one particular sport. It's healthy um, and can actually grow participation in your own sport if you don't try and monopolize them. Uh, Patrick McEnroe talked about uh, sm the value of, of smaller courts and uh, age-appropriate uh, um, ways of uh, engaging with the game. Um, Patrick also talked about uh, have you know the haves helping the the, uh, the have-nots uh, through you know equipment partnerships uh, that can be valuable. It's obviously uh, had an effect uh, in uh, or apparently had an effect in, in growing the game of tennis by reaching out to uh, to uh, recreation. Uh, groups like uh, like uh, that in uh, Richmond. So uh, also, um, you know, Rosalind talked about keeping costs down. I mean, the idea of a one-day tennis tournament, which doesn't force parents to to uh, pay for a hotel, um, that probably makes some of these games a heck of a lot more accessible. Um, Steve talked about the value of creating a national structure. Now, every NGB, I guess, is a national entity, um, uh, but but being uh, and, and we could probably continue the conversation a little bit further later on, but I mean, what's the difference between a national entity and a national structure? Well, I think what I think you're saying is that be very uh, aggressive at, uh, at, at talking to your coaches and talking to your community, pushing good education down the pipeline, um, and, and asking some things of them, whether it be positive coaching alliance training or otherwise. Um, train the coaches, I guess maybe that's part of it as well. We heard that from several people. <laughs> Uh, Ed Foster Simeon talked about uh, incorporating nutrition information into coaching. When we do, when we're dealing with the obesity crisis in, this, crisis in this country, it's really a there's a calories in and there's a calories out side of it. I mean, this group is specifically focused on the calories out side of it, but maybe there's some good opportunities there to uh, to, to marry those uh, those goals. Uh, small side of games, you know, uh, you know, tab. Uh, uh, Tab, you know, you know the value of that in soccer. I've heard that from several other people. I mean, when you have small-sided games, you don't need as much space. In an urban community, maybe you don't have to fix up a 100-yard field. You can just fix up a, a smaller field. Maybe it's a lot more cost-effective. Um, and, uh, and then finding tools, as, as Steve Spinner talked about, finding tools uh, or getting tools to kids that will um, allow them to find sports that they that are tailored to their interests, perhaps their perhaps their body type, uh, their physiology, uh, sports they may have real success in that they just simply were not aware of. Um, so, hopefully that's uh, that's a pretty hey, good summary. Tom, can I, I I I was just thinking as taking notes during the session here about um, awareness of the media, and what what uh, learnings we could take from here and maybe make something happen in the media, and. Um, one of them was uh, timely screaming for ideals. Um, we have all the, we have things like the BCS championship, we have bracketology, the final four. Those are opportunities for us, for people who are really into the media or a part of the media to get on the soapbox and start screaming about ideals such as graduation rates for elimination or inclusion in championship play. Um, finding storytelling that is going to be attractive to large audiences that kind of are poignant to some of the uh, issues and ideals that we talked about here. What Nancy talked about is celebrating victories. You know, um, it's interesting that the seminal piece on Pat Summit, the leading women's coach of all time, was done by Gary Smith, a man. Nobody's ever really done a piece on somebody like, uh, on that level of somebody like Sue Inquist, whom I've gotten to know through ESPNW. Uh, uh, Donna mentioned the World Cup 99 women's team. Those are just examples in the gender category of where the media and people here who can influence the media. You know, sometimes we're jerks and we're sitting around and we're thinking, well, what should we do here? Sometimes a phone call from somebody could say, well, why aren't you doing this? And it can affect a decision and a change and maybe some visibility for some of the issues that we're talking about. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, John, can I just respond to that for a second? Um, as a, this is a speaking of my former reporter hat. Uh, <laughs> and um, it seems to me there's also an uh, obvious opportunity that often gets missed, particularly around the tournament times, which is to write the man bites dog stories. 
and the myth debunking stories. And um, there, each year that Arnie has spoken up about the issue of low graduation rates, there's been blowback from a few select coaches uh, that suggest that it's uh, crazy to expect teams to be able to graduate half their players uh, if they want to be eligible for postseason play. But there's a whole series of myths embedded in that idea that really deserve some analysis, in my view, on the part of the media. Um, is it true that teams that win NCAA championships uh, have low graduation rates? Is it true that, um, that uh, the graduation rate of, of African American players is going to be low? And, or there's going to be a huge gap between the white and, and, and black graduation rates. If you look at Rich Lapchick's numbers, it turns out in a lot of, time, a lot of schools that's not the case. Um, is it true that the big NCAA sports are making bundles of money for all of their institutions? Well, that's also false. Um, most schools are losing money, um, and just a handful of schools and a handful of teams make money. So there's there's a whole series of myths that are embedded in the idea that teams can't be expected to graduate half of their players and do well in Division I play. And, and they're mostly malarkey. And I, I'd love to see the media go after some of those man bites dog pieces at, at tournament time. OK, so we're, uh, we're going to move to the uh, next session here, 35 minutes uh, into it. So Paul, we'll get you in the next one here. The, um... Let me make just one comment, yeah, go ahead, because Don. I'm going to have to leave early. My daughter's graduating from Catholic. Yeah, um, right. I just want to say thank you very much for putting this together. It's another beginning, a um, lot of great thinking. Um, to your point, David, I worked with Arnie Duncan in Chicago on the Olympic bid. And when you talk about sympathy and not a lot of support from the government, it just speeds the fact that we really have to own this movement and do it ourselves, like we did with Title IX. You know, we had to create a foundation of interest and support, and it t turned out to be a great coalition to protect that law. Um, yes, we had the teeth of the law that impacted opportunities in schools, which I think we, we still have to revisit. I don't want to give up on it. Even though we've got economic cuts, how are we going to compete with China when they put the value of the education of their children first? And we have to deal with education, as Edwin said, and that combination, as, as Apollo talked about. So I'm, I think we have to push our government, too, and, and be relentless. But I, thank you for, for letting me participate. Thank you, Tom. Donna. Can I just add that um, we've been doing a lot of work on the study of school sports. And at the local level, we've collected th over 1,000 articles on cuts. And this last year, we're just about to print, is $1.5 is being cut from school sports. You can't talk about the urgency of this issue n any greater than that. And it's mostly being cut at the middle school level to preserve the high school teams. And then it's being cut at the multiple sport level to preserve sometimes the football team, because that's the only thing that makes money for the school. And that's a very male-specific kind of sport when we talk about equity of play. So I, I, I think that... The, I, I just want to go back. The, there's an issue that people aren't aware of how urgent this is, and Janet talked about it. They don't know that three miles down the, the street is a 7% participation rate, and we've got to get that awareness out there as, as, as a first step to sort of saying, you know, how do we respond to this, and how do we get non-traditional players in this room, like nonprofits, churches, because they're the only safe place to play anymore because of all the obstacles we talked about. Right. And, we've, and, and, and they're not only having the pressure of having to pick up the slack because sports are being cut from public schools, they're also having the pressure of having to inspire a kid to want to play sports anymore because they're not even playing. They're like, why would I even go down the street anymore? And an active lifestyle is the way to be. So they have a double effort as non nonprofits to sort of respond to this emergency. Right, right, good. Yeah, it is, I mean, this is the first step, but I, but you know, I, you know, I, I know we didn't just bring you here today to to talk. People want solutions. Um, a lot of folks invested time and and their own plane tickets and hotels and so forth to be part of this conversation. And again, not just to sort of kick things around, but actually take it somewhere.